Good afternoon and welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. We're streaming live from the Boathouse at Confluence Park and we also have an audience here with us today and we want to welcome all of you to our forum. My name's Jane Scott and it is a privilege and an honor to serve as the President and CEO of the Columbus Metropolitan Club and to be able to welcome you here today. We also would like to welcome several new members to the Columbus Metropolitan Club, Sharon Ivanko with J.P. Morgan Chase and Karen Pack. So thank you so much ladies for joining. If you would like to know more about the Columbus Metropolitan Club or make sure that you get our announcements every week, you can learn more about us, register events, join CMC, or even renew your membership if you're already a member, and make a donation anytime at columbusmetroclub.org. Today the forum, Social Determinants of Health, is the first of many in a new series we're calling Optimal Health, presented by Nationwide Children's Hospital and OSU Wexner Medical Center, with additional support today from Hospice of Central Ohio. We are live streamed thanks to our live stream partners, WOSU Public Media, the Dispatch Media Group, WBNS 10 TV, and PNC. We'd also like to thank all of those of you who have purchased virtual seats for today's forum. We're really grateful for your support and partly because of your support, we're, be, we're able to continue live streaming and providing the programs to our whole community. Today, the CDC tells us the conditions in places where we live, learn, work, and play affect a wide range of health risks and life outcomes. We also know there are stark differences in measures of health between neighborhoods and ethnicities. When the social determinants of health are so important and so vastly different, how do we get health equality or equity? Please welcome CEO Impact Community Action, Bo Chilton. Bo, welcome, and it's okay Thank for the audience to clap. <laughs> Thank you. Chair of the Department of Family Medicine at OSU, Dr. Wanda Oliwala. O close? Close, okay, I practiced that. And the Interim Director of Professional Development at the John Glenn College of Public Affairs at OSU, and the former Director of Governor's Office of Health and Transformation, and our host, Greg Moody. Greg's gonna make a few short comments to set the stage, and we'll lead the conversation. So Greg, it's all yours, thank you. Right. Thank you. Well, thank you, I've been looking forward to the Optimal Health Series and its focus on social determinants of health, um, which I'll just briefly describe as an introduction to our panel. Where we live, work, and play affect our health. Differences across communities result in differences in health. And to improve health, we need to understand what causes those differences. Here you can see most health is not determined by clinical medicine. Genes and biology are important. For some, this is the most critical determinant of health. And of course, we want access to clinical care when it's needed, but mostly your health is determined before you see a doctor by your physical environment, your health behaviors, and social and economic conditions. The social determinants of health, this definition is from the World Health Organization, are the conditions where we are born, grow, live, work, and age. These circumstances are shaped by the systems that distribute money, power, and resources. Differences in the distribution of money, power, and resources are mostly responsible for unfair and avoidable differences in health status across communities. For example, in the next slide, if you live in Stowe, you can expect to live to almost 90. But in Franklinton, where we are now, life expectancy is 60 years. That's a difference of 30 years of life based on where you live in Ohio. The same is true closer to home in the next slide. Life expectancy in Bexley is 85 years and the Near East is 67. One mile separating 18 years of life. In Grandview, life expectancy is almost 85 and the hilltop is 65. One mile separating 20 years of life. Picture these communities, Bexley and Grandview, Near East and Hilltop, and you can see how the distribution of money, power, and resources impacts health outcomes. So the basic idea with the social determinants of health is that upstream, we can implement policies that improve conditions downstream for everyone. 
but clearly something is wrong upstream because our downstream health consequences are severe. On nearly every measure, infant mortality, heart disease, cancer, homicide, black people suffer worse health outcomes and always have. COVID-19 highlighted the real crisis in an important way. The virus attacks black and white the same. Biologically, race doesn't matter, but it kills black people at more than double the rate of white people because of other socially determined risks. For example, black workers are more likely to be essential employees and required to work despite the risk. Black workers are less likely to have jobs that can be done remotely, and black families are twice as likely to live in densely populated housing. Alongside these health risks, COVID-19 exposed other injustices. In Toledo, Columbus, and Cincinnati, black people were four times as likely to be charged as whites for violating stay-at-home orders. And 40% of black children received no instruction during the lockdown, compared to 10% of white. There is important work in this space to address social needs, linking individuals to safe housing, reliable transportation, good jobs, all of which improves health outcomes downstream. But the real issue is still further upstream. Again, the distribution of money, power, and resources is mostly responsible for differences in health status. Privilege in these areas, wealth, representation, education, flows downstream as opportunity and better health outcomes. And the legacy of slavery and segregation in these systems and current forms of racism flow downstream as hardships, disadvantages, and poor health outcomes. Reducing health disparities means rethinking the systems that distribute money, power, and resources, and eliminating any legacy of racism embedded within them. Franklin County and the city of Columbus were among the first to declare racism a public health crisis, and many others have followed. It's in that spirit of action and reflection that we turn to our discussion today. Um, and I've got to say, I've been really looking forward to the, the conversation. Uh, let me just kick it off by saying, um, you know, where do we start? Um, how, have, how have you seen, uh, maybe setting the stage for us, how have you seen racism impact health? Yeah, so thank you all for being here and thank you for that great introduction. Uh, my name is Dr. Wando Olaiwala. I'm the chair of the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center. And I have um, the great fortune of having both medical training and public health uh, training as well. And so I'll just start off with sharing some of my observations and experiences. And I'm very, very glad to see Franklin County and all so many of the other cities and towns, um, not only here in Ohio, but across the nation, really start to actually explicitly call out racism as a social determinant of health and also as a public health crisis. So I'll speak mostly to uh, the medical field and uh, my colleague, Bo, will speak more to community related activities. So I wanna just uh, maybe set the stage and tell a, a quick story. Um, I'm fortunate my husband and my, my two children are here today and um, during the pregnancy of my second child, my daughter, um, I was uh, enormously sick and uh, just had a number of different complications throughout the course of that pregnancy. At the time, I was a busy executive. I was a chief medical officer of a large network of um, community health centers across the state of Connecticut. In fact, the largest one in the state of Connecticut. Um, I, you know, we had my we had a great family, great home, um, living a, a very good life. Uh, and so, when I started to seek care for some of the challenges that I was having during that pregnancy, I kept on getting pushed out of the system. And I, I remember vividly one of the times that I had been taken to the emergency room for some complications um, that I was, some symptoms that I was experiencing during the pregnancy. The emergency room uh, physician completely disrespected and disregarded me and said, you know, I know how hard it must be for you as a single mom trying to make ends meet. And I had never said anything about my, my marital status, um, nothing about anything. Um, and, and so, um, and he said, but you know, I think, you, you know, maybe you might just be a little bit anxious. I've, I've seen this a lot of women and I just completely dismissed my, my symptoms. So I later, you know, I later ended up getting admitted to the hospital for, um, for a very serious problem during that pregnancy. And, um, and before I went upstairs to be admitted later, I had to push. I mean, I was saying, no, I've looked this up. Um, it's very common to have pulmonary emboli earlier in the pregnancy. I don't understand why you're not working me up. I, you know, called my brother who was also a physician and had him talk to the physician. And finally they, you know, took it seriously and ended up getting admitted and I was there for a week. 
And before I went upstairs, I said to him, what, what made you make those assumptions about me? I had not said anything to you about anything related to my kind of socioeconomics or anything, but you just assumed a lot about me. And based on what you assumed, you, dis you disregarded me. And so when I think about that, and I think of those statistics that were shared, fortunately, you know, my daughter's here, she's 10 years old, she's beautiful, the pregnancy went well, so I should say that part too, so people don't you know, feel like it all was bad. But I had to fight really to be respected and for my concerns to be appreciated. And when I look at the, that staggering data that's shown up there about uh, you know, the, the infant mortality rate um, for black women here in, in Ohio, one of the highest disparities in, in um, white and black infant mortalities in the country, um, I think about, you know, that could have easily been, been us. And it wasn't really about, you know, people say sometimes, well, the reason why we have those disparities is because of poverty or is because of, you know, low education or people don't really understand how to work the healthcare system. Well, here I was, a very savvy healthcare consumer, um, socioeconomically fine, highly educated, and it still happened. And so what I, what I take from that is that we, the, the biological construct um, that racism has been kind of perpetuated by is not really real. There's no real difference between the pain or the symptoms of a black pregnant woman and the pain or the symptoms of a white pregnant woman. And so if you take that away, all those other things, and you see that those, those disparities still persist, Serena Williams, with all her fame and money, still had enormous problems when she was accessing health care for her during her pregnancy. So it's really not about that. And that's why I'm really glad to see that we have actually called out explicitly this issue of racism, because we have been trained in health care to actually perpetuate some of the stereotypes that have been, that have been um, put on different communities. And if you're educated that way to be able to think like that, then when a, when a woman like me walks in your door, it doesn't matter. I can have all the education, all the money in the world. A Serena Williams can walk in and you'll still experience it. So I'm really glad to hear that we're, we're calling it out. And we know that the results of that are very, very, very um, disastrous. So the cumulative stress of being an African-American in this country, having uh, police brutality, experiencing the toxic effects of anxiety, watching on the news and seeing the way the media portrays African Americans across the country, and knowing that as for me as a mother, as a wife, as a daughter, that any of my family members could be subject to any of these challenges at any time, and have been, and will be, and continue to be, um, that stress is a, is a very common cause over time of premature death in our population. So when you see those disparities that are existing by zip code, this false construct of race that really has no biological meaning but has now been manifest in racism is part of the problem. Dr. Wando, thank you for um, <clears throat> that analysis. I, I just want to piggyback on something that you talked about. When we talk about opportunity, um, there is a, a database called the Opportunity Atlas uh, that allows us to see the data based upon where people are born, and it has a determination on their life chances and their health outcomes. The idea that someone can grow up just a few blocks away from another and have such disparity and differences in their opportunities um, is, is quite amazing. If we think about for African Americans in particular, um, since 1619, August of 1619 is when um, we have documented uh, the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, and for over 250 years, um, subjugated to chattel slavery, uh, and then another 100 years of Jim Crow segregation, and then the fight for civil rights. When we think about trauma, now we talk about trauma-informed care, and how we don't want to ask, well, what's wrong with someone, but we want to ask, what has happened uh, to this person. And so when we think about the trauma, generational trauma from slavery through all of that subjugation and oppression and how that manifests today in behaviors and differences in outcomes, of course we understand the importance of how that trauma impacts our mental health. Um, and so for me, it's about understanding how do we achieve equity um, versus equality. And so the difference that I would draw there is to treat someone equal is to treat them the same. Um, but what we need to understand is that in order to have equity, um, then we have to have, using the example, if you say that you want to treat everyone equal, everyone is given a pair of shoes. If we want to treat everyone equitably, everyone is given a pair of shoes that fit. 
So we do need to have stratified care based upon the specific needs of the population that we're serving. You know, for us to say that we're, we're colorblind and that we don't see race, that's not benefiting me. I want you to see me as a black man and understand that I have specific challenges and that I have certain privileges being a male or there are certain privileges that come with being white or being light-skinned black male. Um, acknowledging those privileges is, is critically important. Uh, and then us seeing people and really understanding how do we create an equitable society. And that means seeing one another and that means hearing one another. If anything we've learned um, that has come out of the unfortunate tragedy of George Floyd's death is that we need to wake up, see what's happening, and we need to listen. Because riot is the language of the unheard. That was said by Martin Luther King Jr. That riot is the language of the unheard. And so now I feel like as though we are seeing and we are hearing, and now we need to get beyond the dialogue and move to action. Thank you, yeah, I was, I was even reflecting on our discussion of social determinants and three months ago, how far we might have taken this conversation. And then COVID draws attention to disparities in a way that push a little further. And then I think the killing of George Floyd finally calls it what it is in terms of looking head on at elements of the system. But that, that embedded nature, that's, that's hard to get at. Moving from dialogue to action, what are, what are some of the things you see as being constructive for us to take on? What are the things we can do to start kind of undoing what's, what's been built in for so long? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll go first. You know, one of the things that I alluded to earlier was the fact that um, it's speaking from kind of the medical uh, field and the establishment and, and the way that we are trained and educated in medicine uh, is that we are we are trained to socially categorize people in ways that can continue to perpetuate and allow certain stereotypes to, to live. So for example, when I was in medical school, I was taught that African Americans had a higher pain tolerance. And so therefore, when I was in the emergency department and African Americans with sickle cell um, pain or other sorts of chronic pain would come in, it was okay to not really validate or, or believe that pain because they can, they can take a lot more. And that really has its origin in the slavery days when it was, when it was thought that you know, African Americans, um, blacks had, could tolerate more, more whippings, more beatings and um, would not have any problems with that. Um, I've also seen this happen where uh, symptoms are minimized. And so um, when you know African-American women like me, as, as many of you know, are often very much stereotyped as being angry or being aggressive or being overly anxious. And so when you come in and you are, when you are being trained to take care of women from that background, it happens a lot with Latina women as well. Um, the, th the thought is that, well, they're just a little bit more anxious and hysterical, so you can just ignore those things. And so one of the, the challenges that I see is that the, 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 the way we educate physicians and nurses and other healthcare providers is to start to embed those stereotypes into them very early so that when they're practicing, it's no surprise that they see us in the emergency room and they think, oh, you know, probably not a serious thing. So one of the things that I think is hugely important is that we have to really honestly deconstruct and reconstruct medical and health profession education because students are learning things that are, that are really not based in, in science. And you know, we, I, used, I remember when I was a resident, I did my residency in Columbia, at Columbia, New York, and I remember being on rounds and we'd always have to say, you know, so-and-so is a 45-year-old black man with this and that. And you know, one day, someone on rounds said, why do we always have to say what color they are? Does, does it matter for this particular context? And, um, and, and if it does, then fine, but if it doesn't, then why are you making us do that? And so I think that there's a lot we have to do to really rebuild the way we educate the people that are going to ultimately take care of all of us some way or some time in our lives. Yeah, it, it certainly starts with um, education. I, I'll, give, um, I'll give an example of a, a person I know uh, around my age. Um, his father, fought in the Vietnam War, was a soldier. And um, unlike some of his counterparts at the time, was not able to take full advantage of all of the 
um, amenities afforded to soldiers at that time, including the GI Bill, um, um, loans for, for veterans. Um, he grew up in the same house uh, that his family grew up in. Um, and we can look at, um, I'm often asked the question, are these issues really based on race or is it more socioeconomic status? Um, and, and what we have to really talk about is the intersection of race and poverty. And so the, 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 the guy I'm thinking of is, is a perfect example of how racism, systemic racism, it's built in. We don't even notice it hardly. Um, it's built in um, how racism actually perpetuated um, the lower socioeconomic status. And so this, this young man grew up in the same household that his family grew up in and is now raising um, a third generation in that same household. Uh, they live in a neighborhood that has been um, dilapidated for a while um, with uh, a lot of flight from that neighborhood. Um, a lot of that policy then for home ownership was based upon redlining. So again, this is where systemic racism comes in and has an economic impact. And so based upon um, him raising his children in that particular house, third generation that grew up in that house, um, their opportunities are limited. The neighborhood schools are not strong. Um, and so, <clears throat> The work opportunities are not strong. Uh, this gentleman ended up um, selling drugs to make money, um, was uh, eventually uh, arrested. Uh, the terms of the arrest were a bit murky. Um, we believe there were racial profiling at, at play. Um, not to say that he was not guilty, but the circumstance by which he was pulled over was murky at best. Um, again, uh, possible racism based upon racial, racial profiling. Um, because of systemic policies or because of governmental policies, um, which had heavier weight for crack cocaine versus powder cocaine, um, this person basically served almost 20 years of his life. Um, now that household grows up without a father. Um, and again, we talk about was this racism or was this basically poverty? And what I would say is it's the intersection of both. One contributes to the other. Um, so what we need to do is have truth and reconciliation in our educational system. Um, unfortunately, much of what we've been told, at least when I was growing up, I hope it's different now, is more of the truth. Just now we're starting to see a lot of monuments come down from the Confederacy and, and the story that we've been told about Columbus and who he was and how he discovered America. See, now we're starting to uncover the truth. And so I think that um, in order for us to have peace and prosperity for all, we have to have truth and reconciliation. And that starts with educating our young people. And I'm glad to see that a lot of young people are asking their parents some very tough questions about why have I not learned this history and this truth before. Uh, so I think it starts there. You've both made a decision to provide your own personal leadership. Um, Dr. Leah Wallet, you are on the front lines of the consequences of downstream health problems. And Mr. Chilton, you're in the community trying to connect to uh, transportation and housing and, and the social needs people have. Um, from, from that viewpoint, where do you find the most encouragement? Where do you think, where do you see things changing in the way, um, either over time or, or very recently, that you feel are really going to get the kind of traction that's needed? Where, where do you see that leadership emerging? And partly I ask for us listening, where, we, where can we attach our efforts to support the type of leadership that's going to be required to bring about real change? So uh, for me, I mean, I, I think I've been really happy. I mean, I, I joined um, the Wexford Medical Center just a few months ago. So I came back to Columbus after being gone for almost 20 years um, to be chair of the department. Um, and um, I've been really, really happy to see some of the efforts that have been going on around diversity, equity, inclusion before all this 
kind of blew up, but but certainly um, the ongoing uh, kind of encouragement and, and intention around making sure that we were addressing some of these issues. Uh, one thing that I think that is very important, I mean, we, if you think about African Americans, we make about 12, 13% of the population, but when you get to higher levels of leadership uh, for faculty, you know, senior leadership in, in medical centers, academic institutions across the nation, you see those numbers drop significantly to, you know, maybe two, three percent. And I, I think that we have to be really thoughtful about making sure that we're building the pipeline and making sure that the, you know, we, we know that structurally, as, as Bo mentioned, and systemically, it's very, very hard for people of color in general to advance in, in the health professions and to be promoted into senior leadership positions, to be mentored so that they can succeed. But we know that that starts much earlier in the pipeline, right? So, you know, this is not like all of a sudden you get to, to medical school residency education and then these problems occur. These are problems that are happening because of the failings of our schools and the educational system. But I do think that being able to really actively say the word racism, like actually say that, and recognize that as a contributing factor to how uh, historically African Americans have been suppressed and oppressed in in medicine from where I, where I sit is really, really important. I've really been happy to see our, you know, our, our chancellor, you know, President Drake, uh, be able to actually call those things out and, and do that so that we can start moving towards dialogue. And so we've, we've just uh, uh, announced an anti-racism action plan that our medical center is going to be undertaking where we're gonna be looking at a number of different policies through kind of an anti-racism lens. We're going to be looking at our education um, looking at how we advance faculty and staff and how we create opportunities for people to grow, looking at how do we relate to our communities and what kind of investments are we making to make sure that the communities around us are thriving and that we can, we can mitigate some of the disparities that we're seeing. So I feel pretty hopeful that we are going to make real change because we have leaders um, from diverse backgrounds who care about these issues and are going to push it forward and I think that's really important. Um, we also have a lot of momentum that's been given at the highest levels of leadership. And then honestly, we have communities that are, that are ready and waiting for us to do something. So I think those things all combined put us in a position where I think we'll, we'll move forward this time. I'm most encouraged by the broad cross-section of support. You know, four years ago when the statement was made, Black Lives Matter, that became a very polarizing statement um, in our community and um, a lot of pushback that said, well, all lives matter. I think now the circumstances have shifted where now I see a lot of people who, who are not black who are saying black lives matter. And, and of course all lives matter, but that was never in question. There was a question about whether black lives matter to, to America. Um, based upon slavery, based upon the fact that when, when someone is stopped, we don't hear about other ethnicities and races being killed. We hear about black people, black men in particular. And so that was a question. Um, black Lives Matter, it, it's an affirmation among black people who felt as though our lives did not matter. Um, but now I see a broad cross-section of people who are saying, yes, black lives do matter. Um, as do all lives. Um, I'm most encouraged by the young people. Uh, there's a lot of energy and excitement, and so now I wanna turn that passion and that protest into a plan. And so we're working with young people. Um, I'm very excited about our partnership with um, uh, the social change department at Ohio State, and so that's something I wanna connect with you on, uh, Dr. Wando. Um, I'm very excited though about the energy that I'm seeing with the young people and getting out to vote, um, but not only having voter registration, but voter education, talking about civic engagement. And I believe that we as adults need to put our money where our mouth is. We can't just let the protest voice be out in the street. It needs to come into the decision-making um, arenas and tables. Uh, on my board, I have millennials. Um, we have a 21-member uh, board. Uh, seven of those seats are democratically elected. 
we have community elections, and we had a young person who was 25 and decided she wanted to run. She ran and she won. Um, and so she has a voice on the governing body of my nonprofit. She has influence in determining how our resources are going to be allocated and making sure that they're allocated for all people in our community. And so I'm most encouraged about the young people and the energy and the excitement. And this feels very different uh, than times in the past. The thing I would liken it to is the energy and momentum that I saw coming out of the civil rights movement, um, particularly once um, we had the image of Emmett Till burning in the brain of Rosa Parks as she sat down on that bus and launched the Montgomery bus boycott. It was the symbolism of that imagery that really fueled that movement. And so George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Aubrey Ahmaud uh, Arbery, all of those, that trio of incidents that people have witnessed and no longer dismiss um, the pain and the stories of people who have said, I have suffered this oppression, this subjugation. This has been my real experience. It's opened the door to conversations with people to ask, well, what has been your experience and for people to share? Um, so it's, it's the open communication and it's the young people that has me very encouraged and excited about the future. Can I just add one thing Please. to that? Because I, I as, as Bill was talking, I was thinking about something that I've also noticed and I've really appreciated it, which is that I, I think that for a long time, many white people did not feel horror when they would see the killing or you know the brutality against a black young man or, or, or woman on TV. Like it was just like another thing that you see in the news and you kind of continue past it. And what I've been seeing now is that people are actually saying, I'm horrified by seeing this. Because if you, don't, if you don't fundamentally think that the life of my son is worth the life of his son, then you will never be horrified when you see someone brutalizing my son on TV, right? You would never be. So you, I think for people to start to feel that horror and say like that could actually be, that's someone's child, that's someone's brother, that's someone's son, that's someone's you know, mother or that's someone's sister. Like if, if, and, that, and, and to actually internalize that and think as a, as a human, like this is horrific. I've been really happy to see that people are starting to see that. It's not just kind of this, these things that we've been indoctrinated to see in the media all the time that seem like, you know, it's, it's these, these, these people of color over there and that's not me, it's not anyone in my family, but actually seeing that and saying that that could be anybody that I know and this is absolutely horrific. And I feel like I have not seen that until recently and now I'm really happy to see that people are actually recognizing and putting themselves kind of in the places of people that are, that are going through these experiences and trying to learn empathy around it. So uh, in just a few minutes, we're going to open it up for questions. Um, uh, live audience questions here are welcome, and also folks on the live stream, uh, you have an ability to send your questions in. We're looking forward to that. Um, you know, I appreciate your talking about the call to action for young people, and I uh, hope this doesn't put you on the spot too much, but my son's here. Nwando, I know your children are here. Bo, I know you have children. Um, what, do you, what do you say to them? To, to speak to them kind of in this moment, what is, what is the encouragement you offer uh, to, to that generation? And in addition to the call to action, do something. Um, what is the encouragement you provide? I mean, for my kids, uh, we've had a number of different conversations about everything that's been going on and have been, um, I've been challenged by some of the things that they've asked me because they just don't fundamentally understand why we are the way we are, and it's it's kind of bizarre for them to think that we treat people differently because of the color of their skin. I don't think that they really fully understand why that is. Um, I've also had to talk to them a lot about fear of of police and being brutalized by the police. And you know, there's um, there are countless stories of kids and particularly children in my family and some of my nephews and um, who have been just terrified by you know what's going to happen if I if I go out. I've got to you know be there. And I've I've also become a lot more protective of them, like, no, you can't, you know, ride your skateboard around the corner um, just because I need to make sure that you get back or if you do go, you know, have this thing on you so I can track you um, and know where you are. Um, so, I, you know, I think what I'd say to them, because they're, they're smarter than us, um, the generation behind me is much better and more aggressive and they're, the millennials are just um, just so passionate and, and inclusive in ways that I, I think generations before them have not been. So what I'd say to them is just, you know, keep 
speaking your truth, be, be you, don't, don't let us mess you up, right? Because you came in and you've got really good ideals and values um, and you believe in a world that we have not created for you yet. And so just keep fighting for that and don't let us mess you up. That's my, that's my advice. I agree with that. I, I am not naive. I, I have spent 13 years as a CEO of a poverty fighting organization. Um, and, and we've seen a lot of trauma and we've seen a lot of positive, um, hopeful, hope inspiring stories. Um, the thing that I agree with you is let's just not mess them up. To the young people, keep asking those questions. Stay curious. Um, you know, I had my son once tell me, he said, well, Dad, you know, some of the problems that you're describing sound like old people problems. <laughs> I, I, I don't have those issues with my friends. And so I said, well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. I said, but keep having honest conversations. Um, they're actually talking about these things. And you don't have to have it all figured out. There's no blueprint to how we navigate the future. But keep pressing, keep asking those questions, keep reading, keep being curious. And I think that together, um, this generation will help us solve some of our most intractable problems. And you will be the ones who inherit whatever needs to happen uh, with, with uh, climate change and global warming. And so you need to stay at the table and push to uh, be at the table to make those decisions. I'll ask you for one last closing thought, but it occurs to me too that, that this coming generation has tools that are, that are new and very powerful too. Be, being able to witness history as it's happening and share that and communicate that, there, there are tools now that I think um, may uh, uh, be difficult for an older generation, but it's just natural and it's, it's the way things are for the new generation. One thing I'd say too, um, uh, Last week, uh, the Metropolitan Club hosted a conversation with young black men. There's going to be a conversation with young black women. I would encourage everybody to go back and hit that link and watch that because in terms of being encouraged about handing off decisions to a next generation, all you have to do is watch a few minutes of that and you can feel really secure that we're, we're headed in a good direction. Um, any final thought? Uh, as we as we move into questions. Yeah, I mean, I, my, my final thought is just that for everyone to take away is really just, you know, think about the value that you place on, on life and on opportunity. And if you can just retool a little bit of how you've been socialized or indoctrinated and unlearn some of the things that you've learned already um, and, and the false narratives that may, you may have been taught at a very young age and have kind of continued to have throughout your life. If you can do that and, and just decide, and again, I'll, I'll leave you with this because I think it's really important to me, you know, as a, as a mother, that if you can leave and believe that the value and opportunities um, of, the, of the life of my two children are the same as, should be the same as the value you place on the life and the opportunities that you provide to someone else's children because they're non-black and they're, they're white. If you can believe that and you can actually believe that um, and see those as those, I don't care where they're from, I don't care what they look like, they should have the exact same opportunities and they should have opportunities that are equitable so maybe even more opportunities created because of the disadvantage or the vulnerabilities that have been, that have been placed upon them. If you can see that and you can believe that and you can imbibe that, um, then I think that we can go a long way in making making this this world and this country and particularly this this state a better place. I will say for those that are are ready for action, um, in particular the young people and, and people in this community, um, I encourage you to check our website to get involved. Um, we will have a robust um, voter education and civic engagement um, program. Uh, we want to look at policy, uh, things that if, if we really want to make sure that we have an equitable society, we got to pay attention to what's happening to the Community Reinvestment Act and the reforms that are being proposed. It will be devastating to communities um, and erase a lot of the progress that has been made. So those are specific policies that we need to take closer, uh, pay closer attention to. There's a lot happening now around criminal justice reform. Uh, and civilian review boards. And so 
I'll be involved in that work locally and definitely want to get some young people connected to that. And then finally, I'm going to say this. Um, as we talk about um, social determinants of health, we have to look at the wealth disparity. Um, the inequity continues to grow and it's just not sustainable. If we look throughout history, um, this type of disparity and inequity is just not sustainable. We have to find a way to have shared prosperity. Um, and part of that means corporations paying their fair share of taxes. Um, it's going to take resources for us to repair some of the damage that has been done. And the only way that we're going to be able to do that is if everyone pays their fair share and we have equity. Uh, so those are the types of policy um, and, and um, advocacy uh, issues that we need to be engaged with. And that kind of is the final word on our social determinants around money, power, and resources really being kind of the determinant factors ultimately of, of where we need to bring about the change. Um, so at this point, uh, it's the CMC's tradition to take audience questions. Jane Scott, CMC's president, is curating questions from the live stream audience. Um, if you're here in our audience, please remember to keep your microphone time to the question, uh, and we thank you for avoiding editorial comments. Uh, but Jane, I'll look, I'll look to you for the first question. Wonderful. I have about, <clears throat> I have about five questions. Um, Eric Jenkins from Dedicated Senior Medical Center asks, what is your position on value-based care? Yeah, and I don't um, know what that is. But. Yeah, well, value-based care is basically reforming the way we pay for care. So in the United States, we have a like a fee-for-service uh, model where I'm, you know, the, the hospital, the doctor is paid for seeing you. And so the incentive is for you to continue to see people and maybe see them when you don't necessarily have to as much um, so that you get paid so the fee is for the service actually being provided. In value-based care models, um, what you're looking at is you're paying for value and you're paying for outcomes and you're paying for quality. And so as you think about, um, I'm not paid because I had 20 visits, I'm paid because the visits that I had, I took really good care of those patients and, and, um, and provided really good quality care. So I think value-based care is a really good way to start to think about how do you al allow for kind of equitable delivery of care and assign responsibility to people for being able to provide high quality care to people regardless. And so if we were in a value-based model, some of the things I talked about may not have fully happened because you'd, you'd be really incentivized to take good care of me. So I, I, I'm, a, I'm a, a big fan. I think we have a long way to go before the United States will shift to um, full value-based care, but thank you for that question. I want to piggyback on that. I don't know much about value-based care, but I do know about affordable health care. Uh, and I want to advocate for that. We're the only industrialized nation that does not have a public health system. It's based upon our employment. Um, and that it's, it's crazy that we spend almost 17% of our GDP and have some of the poorest outcomes, health outcomes among the industrialized nations. Uh, so it's time for change there. And actually, just to piggyback on that, because w when you look at the industrialized nations, we also have not just poor clinical outcomes, we have poor access, efficiency, and equity outcomes compared to the, the kind of the main 11 industrialized nations that are, we're usually compared to. So we, we're not, we're, we're spending a lot, but we're not getting a whole lot out of it. Good afternoon. My name is Carla Hicks, and um, it's been researched that the disparity, a lot of it that exists in the social determinants of health are rooted in policy and legislation. And Bo mentioned a few. My question is, are there uh, younger groups, stakeholders, who are looking at policy and legislation? We have House Bill 620 that's proposed by Eric, Representative Erica Crawley. Looking in the proposal is to look at all legislation that's proposed through a health and equity lens. So is there a way that we can get younger people involved in helping to see things move through the legislature. So I'll say um, I'm familiar with uh, Representative Crawley. I was not familiar with that bill, but that's something that I want to get our young people and the people that we're working with now involved in. I like the idea of looking at all legislation through the uh, equity lens. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't know where it's being done well, but I do know that it's very important to do it. And it's one of the things that we're actually committing to is that every single policy, you know, 
hiring, promotion, admission, community partnerships, vendor relationships, selecting patients to be part of our, our, our patient advisory councils, all those things are going to be looked at through what we're calling the anti-racist health equity lens. So hopefully we'll, we'll figure out how to do it and do it well, but I agree that it's very important that we do. This question is from Emily Preto. How will development slash gentrification in inner city impact healthcare and services in five, 10, 15 years? Dr. Well, <laughs> since it's deferred to, to you. So, uh, well, you know, I think that only as you saw on the, on the slide, a very small, fraction of anybody's health and wellness comes from them seeing me in the office, right? So like, if you know, if I, I don't, you know, fantasize that, you know, my role as a doctor in the office with the patient is the most important thing to their health and their life. I know that that's very much not true. I know that the things that will determine their health and their life expectancy are things like blight and violence in their community and um, poor educational structures and uh, ongoing systemic racist practices and policies. And so as you continue to shift people further and further to poverty, which is what gentrification often does, you move people out of places of comfort and for, you know, for whatever type of um, industrialization or you know, advancements that you're looking at, and they continue to move to places where they become either they move into homelessness or they get transitioned into unstable or inconsistent housing, it's, it's almost impossible that that can be good for their health. So as, as we see more and more gentrification, communities push out, people put on the brink of homelessness or put in, you know, in inst instable housing conditions or crowded community housing conditions, we will undoubtedly see uh, worsening of people's health because most of their life is really dictated by those other things and not that office. I'll just add, because we showed the specific example on the slide with, um, the difference in, in the age uh, of someone in Franklinton versus Dublin. Um, I think the number was 60 to 89, um, something of that nature. Well, recently we had a, a hospital close down shop on the west side and relocate a brand new facility um, south of Columbus and um, you know for a lot of different reasons but if we already have a, a significant problem um, with the life chances of someone living on the west side and now we no longer have adequate um, health care being provided on the west side I mean it, it, it's pretty easy to understand what's going to happen um, those uh, cycles of um, inadequate care will continue to be perpetuated. And just like the suggestion for equity in all policies, in healthcare there's a corollary where you can have healthcare in all policies. So you're, as you're looking at transportation and housing and community development, do you have a lens of how that's either taking you closer to better health outcomes or, or keeping you away? And so that, that's a discipline in, in all policies. Next question. For people who look like me, there seems to be two issues dealing with health care. One, as you mentioned, Bo, is the issue of access. I mean, how do we get health care? Do we have insurance? And, but the other issue that often doesn't get talked about is the quality of health care. You mentioned already that in many industrialized c countries, the outcomes are better than America, even though we pay more. And so the question I want to ask the panel is, how would you define quality health care? I'll just say, I've had insurance all my life, but it wasn't until November where I changed my provider. I have my physician's cell phone number. My doctor's office calls every week. Uh, I, I can get groceries and all this stuff, so I'm finding out there, there's a difference. And so I guess I want to know from the panel is how would you define what quality health care means? That's a great, great question. I'm glad that you've you've got a, a provider now that is giving you that kind of attention. You know, I, I one of the the failures, and I've I've written about this. Some of my research has looked at this is around quality improvement in healthcare has been that 
a lot of times, and I think when you go back to Bo's analogy of the shoes, you know, you just give some, everybody a pair of shoes and, and that's a quality, but you give them the shoes that fit, that's equity. What we've done in quality improvement is we've tried to kind of raise the level of quality. So we're gonna do, you know, take on a massive hypertension improvement project and we're just gonna hopefully reduce people's blood pressures. Well, when you do that, what we've seen is that, yeah, globally you might in, in, increase, improve your outcomes, but you've widened disparities because you have not necessarily tailored the interventions that are necessary to the communities and that needed and experienced kind of their hypertension differently. So one of the things that I think um, is really true high quality care is having um, a personal kind of lasting self um, reflective relationship with wh whatever that, whoever that physician or um, care provider is, um, where you are listened to and you are, you are heard. I cannot even m tell you how many times I get patients that come to me and say, wow, I'm so glad you're listening to me, you're listening to me. And I think that we have to train our, our upcoming uh, you know, generation of professionals to really listen, learn, empathize, right? You may not understand all of those things and try not to, you know, try to avoid judgment and, and all the things that happen. I, he I heard a story the other day about people, um, assumptions that are made basically in the, the first 10 seconds of, of meeting and interacting with the patient essentially dictate the way you'll give care to them for the rest of the time that you have them. So being able to train people to really understand how do you deliver empathetic care, meet somebody where they are, and listen more than we talk. I think doctors, we, we, we talk a lot and we don't listen enough. And then when we do listen, we still hear what we, th what we thought we wanted to hear. So I think high quality care is listening, empathizing, building those relationships, understanding that every single person um, is a person and they're not necessarily, I, I cannot make any assumptions about you based on you know, the, the community that you come from or where you live and trying to make sure that we deliver care to meet your needs. I couldn't say it any better. <laughs> Hi, I'm Brian McMichael, I'm from the OSU Medical Center. Well, one of the things that uh, I confronted, uh, I actually came late to medicine and I actually bought my first house uh, not too long ago in uh, uh, Woodland Park, but one of the things I noticed uh, that I think needs to be dismantled uh, that has to do with a whole kind of racket that housing prices have to do with resale value, they have to do with good schools, that have to do with property, local property taxes, funding schools into this kind of spiraling opportunity hoarding versus a downward spiral in, you know, uh, educational opportunities, infrastructure. You know, it seems to me that, you know, this is a racket where people have, you know, they have skin in the game where if we dismantle that, you know, it's gonna hurt you know, resale values, if we say we all, you know, we fund education differently. Do you, do you ever think about that, uh, about how that would affect communities and even access to health care and uh, overall health and communities? So, it, mentioning the way in which our public school systems are funded, um, there's a state allocation that each school district re receives and then um, they're funded by property taxes. So obviously in more affluent areas, they're gonna have more resources uh, to educate their children. Um, that's already been proven to be um, unlawful, um, but we have not figured out the solution. I'm gonna add to that, that when we have major developments in certain neighborhoods, we have to be very careful with our tax abatement policy as well, because it deprives our school systems of much needed resources in order to educate our children. And so again, I'm going back to policy reform. We need to look at our tax abatement process. We need to look at how we're appraising homes and um, what's occurring there in terms of gentrification, uh, particularly for a lot of our seniors. Um, and, and so th this goes down a whole nother road, um, but yes, uh, we need to find a way to equitably educate our children across the public school um, system. Well, thank you, speakers. I heard words today uh, such as anxiety, generational trauma, the intersection of race and poverty, the distribution of money, power, and resources. 
I think there's going to be some other conversations we're going to be having about some of those kinds of things. Uh, we'd also like to welcome you back, as Greg said, uh, young black women will be taking the stage on July 15 to share their perspectives. And if you have not seen the forum last week, uh, I also would echo Greg. It was very powerful. These young men were just brilliant, and I would really encourage you to go back and take a look at it. And we hope you'll turn in next Wednesday at noon online or join us here in the room at the Boathouse as we continue the series, Racism, Where Do We Go From Here, with a discussion about media bias. We'll have three journalists uh, on stage next week. Thanks to our Optimal Care Series presenters, OSU Wexner Medical Center and Nationwide Children's Hospital. And thanks today uh, to Hospice of Central Ohio for your additional support. And we're also grateful for our live stream partners, OSU Public Media, WBNS 10 TV, PNC, and the Dispatch Media Group, and to all of you who purchased, purchased virtual seats. Thank you. Thank you for helping us keep the conversation going. And finally, special thanks to our speakers, Bo Chilton, Dr. Wando Oailola. Close, close. All right, we'll get it. Yeah, and Greg Moody. Thank you so much. We hope to see you all again. In the meantime, be well and stay safe. Thank you.